I want to greet the church in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We want to thank God for the opportunity that he has given us once again uh, to come together to worship him. It is my prayer and my hope that uh, during the day you were able to meet your daily objectives, that you had a purposeful day and a purposeful living, uh, but should, and also that you had a good day. Um, or at least a day that you could manage. Um, but should you not have had a purposeful day or a meaningful day, um, it's never too late to at least make sure that tomorrow you start living meaningfully. By the way, um, when you read the book of Genesis um, at the creation of the world, there is something that I'd like you to pay attention to. Um, God did things. He didn't set time. He would do things. When he was done doing things, then that was called a day. So he didn't create 24 hours and then try to fill things into 24 hours. He did things. When he was done doing his things, he called that a day. The measure of life is not how many years you lived, it's what did you accomplish in it. You could live 50 years in time, but you may have only lived two months in purpose. So the key is not to strive for many years, it's to fill them with things. It's, 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 it's quite unnecessary to live around for 70 years and accomplish nothing. Okay. So I, 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 I would advise that you stop stressing about how long you will live and start worrying about the kind of things you are filling your life with. Um, because that is what God teaches us. That what matters is what fills the time, not the length of the time. Are we still together? Um, some, 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 some people make it challenging to bury them as a pastor. Uh, because sometimes the family expects you to say a few kind words about the deceased and you honestly have nothing to say other than that they were born yeah. and at some point you came across them yeah. now you've been informed they are dead make it easy for the saints not to lie in your funeral <laughs> fill your time with purpose this way we won't search for things. Are we still together? Um, and, 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 and so that is why I started by saying it is my prayer that you had at least a purposeful day, a meaningful day, or a day that you could manage. If you didn't, I would challenge you to start filling up your days with meaning. Don't worry about the hours. Don't worry about the hours, okay? A whole week in time could be equal to one day in purposeful work. Just make sure that you, you do things, you finish up things, you reflect on things, and it's meaningful, the things that you were um, part of. There was a, a, a famous South African musician um, who died quite some time ago. Um, he, he used to sing with uh, three ladies. Um, his name was uh, Uma Shatini, and he sang with three ladies called the Ama Odela Queens. Um, if you don't know them, it says your age. If you know them, it says something about your age also. I know them, so that puts me in a particular category. Um, he, he went to the UK at, in, in 1982. He went to the UK for a concert, for a tour. At that time, South Africa, of course, was under apartheid, and there was big international pressure for this uh, segregation system to come to an end. So black South African musicians were getting the attention from the international community to come and sing and do tours in Europe. By so doing, they would also get to share the stories of what is happening in this uh, closed-up space called SA, so that it would galvanize government 
governments and activists and private sector to join in, in that space. So he, he left, he went to the UK for a tour. When he came back, he, he was interviewed on what was then known as Radio Zulu. Today they call it Ukozi FM. Now there was a guy on Radio Zulu back then um, who was a, a host. His name was Upoloza Wawanzimand. Now he's a senior, senior man at the SAPC, um, one of the, the top uh, uh, senior managers. So he, he interviews him and says to him, so um, tell us, how was it in London? You, you were in the land of the queen, uh, how was it? And Mashatini says, uh, we arrived. We ate. We slept. And the following day, we woke up, we ate, we ate, we slept. And for a good two minutes, that is what he said until Portloza had to change the line of questions because he could clearly pick up that nothing was going to change. See, I think that is the challenge with most of us. That is exactly the story of our lives. We wake up, we eat, eat again, sleep. And this includes people who go to work. Going to work doesn't make you a meaningful person. Let me put it to you this way. God gave you a job to put food, on, to put food on, your, on your table, but your job is not your purpose. He gave you a job to food, put food on your table so that as you fulfill your purpose, your table is not harmed. So waking up, getting into the car, driving to work, that's not purposeful. That is what all human beings must do in order for food to be on the table. <laughs> Purpose has to do with those things that you do, knowing very well that no one will thank you. But you do them for their greater good and for their joy, regardless of the response of the world to you doing those things. So don't confuse the two. For your job you get paid, that's not purposeful. Even being a pastor, being a pastor is not your purpose. Every pastor must find his purpose within the ministry. We get paid to be pastors, but our purpose is that thing we do and do with love, such that even when the conference doesn't reimburse me, I still do it because it is bigger than what I can report. It defines who I am, not what my employer expects. Let me leave you. Okay. All I was just saying is, can you please be purposeful? Thank you. Um, please be. Please be purposeful. I think this came up in my mind now because we are doing a youth work of prayer, and I worry, especially when I talk to young people, but we'll address all of this again later on in the context of the second coming of Jesus Christ. Young people are living purposeless lives in a very painful way. You date someone for four years, you both know you've got no direction. Four years. Four, four full years of kissing somebody who has no feature in your eternity. Four, four, that you will never regain. You've been hugging some idiot for no reason. For four years, four, and this thing is going nowhere. Four years, soon you will be dying and you will regret those four years. Wasted time. Money wasted. Do you know how expensive dating is? <laughs> dating is expensive. Those of us who are now married, 
my friends and I who are, who are married, we once sat down and we decided to go through the amount of money we think we have spent in our previous relationships. And here we were only really trying to deal with significant things, like trying to recall birthdays of ex-girlfriends, significant dates and things like that. Never mind the in-betweens that you can no longer remember. As we were all sharing the numbers, we were all tipping at over 400, 500,000 rands spent in relationships of some, when you meet those people in camp meeting, you can't even remember their surname. But they used to be the love of your life. You look at the person coming your way and you think, I know I know you. And I know you used to be important to me. But who are you? And you think of, oh God, help me remember, help me remember. I know they used to meet. I, oh, ah, <laughs> After wasting so many resources. So, hence I'm saying, be purposeful in everything that you do. Be purposeful. Okay? There's nothing wrong. Look, do not be apologetic about your time. Never do that. If a guy comes and asks you out and you're a young woman, please, never be a sucker for love at the expense of your time. Ask a guy, what's your plan? For when? How long? With what? By who? Do you have a plan? You don't. I'm sorry. If he says to you, you are putting pressure for me to get married, the fact that you think it's pressure means you have no direction. The minute the word marriage equals pressure to you, then I'm okay not dating you. These are years I will regret. Be purposeful. Be what? Purposeful. We are reading in the book of uh, Second Kings. Chapter 19 from verse 14. Our theme is Behold, He is coming. Second Kings chapter 19 from verse 14. Behold, He is coming. Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord, the God of Israel, enthroned above the cherubim, you are the God, you alone of all the kingdoms of the earth, you have made heaven and earth. Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. And hear the words of Sennacherib, which he has sent to mock the living God. Truly, O oh God, the kings of Assyria have laid waste to the nations and their lands, and have cast their gods into the fire, for they were not gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore they were destroyed. So now, O oh Lord our God, save us, please, from his hand, that all the kingdoms of earth may know that you are Lord and God alone, and there is no other. Let us bow our heads and pray. Kind and loving Heavenly Father, God in the highest, of all the books written by human beings with our master's degrees and PhDs, the many articles that we have written, the magazines, and every other thing that is out there, none requires more wisdom than Scripture. And that is why we can never approach it on the basis of our academic qualifications or IQ. When it comes to this book, we must humble ourselves and resign everything. And accept and welcome your wisdom, Holy Spirit. For it is the only intelligence that is able to unlock the meaning of scripture. That is why at this moment in time, Heavenly Father, we submit our minds and our bodies and our hearts into your control. That now that the word has been read, let its application, its interpretation be in accordance with your will for our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The story that is recorded here 
begins with a king by the name of Sanukerib. He is an Assyrian um, ruler, and Assyrians historically are known to be vicious, they are known to be deadly, um, they are known to be ruthless. Um, Assyrians were the kind of people who at times um, inflicted uh, a pain for pleasure. When they attacked a country, they were not so much always interested in getting slaves or whatever. They were only interested in just leaving it desolate. For, for, for the joy of removing an enemy. Not necessarily because there's an end game the way, where, where their attack must result uh, in something meaningful. And, and, and so Senukerub um, sends his armies first to destroy Israel. Now, you need, I, I'll try and, 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 and help with a bit of history here so that it, we, we understand. Most of you who, who've been to Sunnyside for a long time, you've heard me preach before, so you're kind of used to um, how I preach. But for those of you who, who've not heard me before, uh, allow me to, to, to just make this interlude. M my field in, in theology is systematic theology. And, and so what I try to do is, as, as I preach, I also try to lecture at the same time. The reason being, I don't want to make an assumption you guys know the background to biblical stories. And then next time you are asked to preach, you tell us of Jonah who swallowed a whale. <laughs> so it is, I prefer that to, I prefer to put in as much information as possible so people can make connections between Bible verses. Is that okay? Right. So, initially if you, if you would have remembered, you would have had Abraham who would have had his son Isaac. Isaac would have had twin boys, Jacob and Esau. Esau's nickname is also Edom. Okay, from whom the Edomites come. And then you would have had uh, Jacob, who would have deceived his brother for the birthright. Then he ran away. Rebecca, his mother, advised him to run away. And he went to live with his uncle Laban. Laban, who had two daughters, you remember, Leah and Rachel. Okay, Rachel was the prettier one, and uh, 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 Leah was the physically challenged one. And then... Um, he, he wants Rachel, he works for Rachel for seven years, and at the night when they were consummating their marriage, he consummated with Leah. There remains an investigative judgment on that part. How he could not know that that was not Rachel. <laughs> I don't care who says what. As dark as it can be, you cannot swipe my wife for somebody else. <laughs> No one can exchange you someone you've been working for for seven years. But let's leave it. I'm just saying there's an investigative judgment that is needed at that portion of that story. So now there are two. So he works for another seven years and he gets Rachel. So he gets two wives, Leah and Rachel. And then he, their father, Laban, gives him two concubines. So he now has four wives. Pause here. There are times when the Bible recommends something and there are times when the Bible mentions something. The Bible is not recommending concubines. It is mentioning a historical fact. So don't live here and ask your wife to find you a concubine. There was no biblical recommendation. It mentioned what used to be done, not what should be done. Okay? So... The four, the four wives are now there. The first wife gives birth to the first four sons, okay? Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah. And then Rachel, the favorite, gives birth to the last borns, Joseph and Benjamin. She dies giving birth to Benjamin. The two concubines give birth to the others who are in between. Are we still together? Now there are 12 boys. The 12 boys quarrel with one of them whose name is Joseph. Joseph. They sell him off to Egypt because of his dreams. There he be ends up in the house of Potiphar and he then gets to be um, a, a, a target toy boy to Mrs. Potiphar. He refuses, she cries rape, and then he ends up in prison. He interprets Pharaoh's dreams, he becomes prime minister of Egypt. He fetches his 11 brothers and his family to Egypt. That is how they arrived in Egypt. All right? Initially at their arrival, they were members of the royal family because they were relatives to prime minister Joseph. Are we still together? Prime Minister Joseph dies. A few pharaohs come who do not have any interest in history. 
And then they realize that there is a growing tribe of people here who are not Egyptians by blood. Then they convert them into slaves. Let's pause there. Sermon for another day. Okay? They were not supposed to stay in Egypt. Joseph was supposed to stay there for seven years and rescue the world from harm. After seven years, they were supposed to go back home. Because they overstayed their welcome, they moved from royalty to slavery. Don't overstay your welcome. You will soon move from a hero to a zero. Stay as long as God wants you in a place. When the mission is done, leave. Some of you are busy bothering us, telling us to pray for your boss, your boss is ill-treating you. Could it be you've overstayed? Maybe the boss is not wrong. Maybe the boss is trying to tell you, you have overstayed your welcome here. It's time to ask God, where should I be now? Not all bosses who persecute you are evil. Some are. Some are the hand of God to get you out. So, they stay in Egypt 420, 430 years as slaves. God raises Moses. Moses gets them out of Egypt on their way to Canaan land for 40 years. Uh, 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 the 40 years in the wilderness, they settle there. First is the period of the judges. After the period of the judges comes Samuel. The first offices of the priests and kings are born. And that is where the, the nation is. Now we come to this story where... The 12 tribes of Israel are about to change. They used to be 12 up until this story. In the year 722 BC, an Assyrian emperor by the name of Senukarub marches towards Israel. When he gets there, remember during the days of King Solomon, the kingdom was split into two. The ten tribes of Israel lived in the north and they were called the kingdom of Israel, also known as Ephraim, also known as Manasseh, also known as Samaria. That is the same kingdom. Okay? The south was the kingdom of Judah where Jerusalem is. There lived the two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, in the south. Because the kingdom had split. Now, Senukerub attacks the north. And in attacking the north, he completely destroyed the ten tribes of Israel. That is why, after the book of Kings, you never hear again of the twelve tribes of Israel. Only Judah remains. Because in 722 BC, they were completely wiped out by the Assyrians. They disappeared from history. The little few pockets that remained intermarried with the Canaanites nations and they completely disappeared. Today there is no trace of them. Zero. What you call a Jew today are the descendants of the house of Judah and the house of Benjamin. The other ten completely disappeared. So, after Senukerub has destroyed the other ten, he then makes his way south to Judah. And the Bible says, Hezekiah became a coward. Hezekiah writes to Senukerub and says, you don't need to attack me like you did my northern brothers. I will give you silver and gold and taxes. You don't need to bother me. So he sends gold and silver. But Senukerub is not satisfied because Assyrians don't kill for purpose. They kill for the pleasure of it. So Senukerub sent his envoys to Judah. And when the envoys get to Judah, they say, standing outside of Jerusalem, they say, who do you think will rescue you from the hand of Senukerub? Why did God not rescue the other ten tribes? If your God is powerful, why did he fail there? Do you not see that you have no hope? Do you not see that there is no way out? Senukerub 
has been marching all over the world. He has conquered nations and has destroyed their gods. What makes your God special? Why do you think your God will be able to rescue you? And the Bible says, Hezekiah's messengers plead with the messengers of Senucherub and they say, please, stop speaking Hebrew. Because they were speaking, they were shouting, and all the people in the city could hear. So they say, please don't speak Hebrew. You are putting fear in the hearts of the people. Speak your home language, Aramaic. We understand it. And these guys say, do you think we came here to only tell you the message? The message is also for your people. And they begin to shout to them and say, do not be deceived by your leaders who claim that God will deliver you. There is no God who will deliver you. You and your gods are under our mercy together with your leaders. If you do this thing, you will survive. Open the gates of Jerusalem. Come out peacefully. We will give you food. We will give you wine. We will take you to a country called Nineveh. There we will show you a good life. But do not be deceived by your kings. When Senukerub had finished sending this message, the messengers came and told Hezekiah the message. And Hezekiah immediately ran to a man whom he knew by blood and knew in the ministry. In those days, there was a prophet by the name of Isaiah. But please pay attention. Isaiah See, English sometimes, um, okay. You, you know your father's brother in English is an uncle, not in Africa. Eh? It's not an uncle, it's your father. It just depends on his position. If he's younger than your father, he's your small father. <laughs> if he's older than your father, <laughs> do you understand? But you, we don't have an uncle from the paternal side in African languages. Uncles are from the maternal side. Do not forget, Hezekiah's grandfather is the king Uziah, who is the brother to the prophet Isaiah. So he calls his grandfather, who is also a prophet, and says to him, we have a problem. Before the problem, Hezekiah was so scared of Senukerub that he even went into the sanctuary of God and stripped it of all its gold and silver and donated it to Senukerub. That is how much he feared the man. Now, he goes to, his, to Isaiah and says, help me. Please plead with God to come through for us. God tells Isaiah to tell Hezekiah, tell the king that nothing is going to happen to you. Do not worry. This man will go back home puffing the smoke that he spoke. Nothing is going to happen. When Isaiah says so, Hezekiah goes back to the palace. When he gets to the palace, he is told that a letter has arrived from Senukerub. And the letter continues with the threats. Now Hezekiah goes to God in the sanctuary the sanctuary that he stripped of gold to pay Senukerub. he walks in there in a debilitated building the story says the door handles were made of gold he removed them the hinges were made of gold he removed them it has become a desolate building he paid his debts from God's treasury. Now in an abandoned building, he comes to seek the God he has robbed. See, that's the thing about life. I'll share with you this illustration. I was with Pastor, uh, Pastor Papu, what, Dr. Papu is Dr. Papu now. Um, um, I was with uh, uh, Dr. Papu, Pastor Papu, and we, he shared with me a story um, 
a gentleman is preaching in a church. Um, looking out the window while preaching, he sees his car being stolen while preaching. So he stops preaching and says to the deacon interpreting for me, for him, my car is being stolen. We need to chase my car. So the deacon says, no problem, I've got my car keys here. So they both leave the pulpit and rush out. <laughs> they get to the deacon's car, start the deacon's car to chase the preacher's car. As they chase the preacher's car, they are not getting close. The, the, the preacher's car keeps on increasing the gap. The preacher says to the deacon, stop. The deacon says, why? He says, that is my car. I know my car. You will not catch my car with this car. <laughs> While he is traumatized by his stolen car, he is proud of its performance. <laughs> it is painful to see it stolen. It is fulfilling to see its engine at, at work. Christians are like God's car that has been stolen by the devil. You know, there are times when God watches us run away from him using his blessings against him. And God has to say, you can't chase them. And the question is, why can't? He says, because they are made in my image. You cannot catch them. Senu Kerub has robbed God and used God's gold for his own fears. But what I like about him is that as, as wrong as that was when the opportunity came, the Bible says then he walked into the sanctuary carrying the letter and he went into the altar and there in front of the altar he knelt and he spread this letter on top of the altar. See on that altar they used to make sacrifices. On that day, there was no animal to slaughter, but there was a letter. Yeah. There was a letter. Yeah. The letter needs to be on the table there. Because the one being slaughtered is not the letter. The author of the letter must be slaughtered. So that he may know that God is God alone. And so he lays the letter at the, the, letter at the altar. It is as if he is asking God to read. He says, you read this. You read what Senukerub has written to us. And you tell me if you will allow this man to do this to your nation. And of course, God responds and says, I am going to slaughter him. This threat that he has made against you will not come true. Now the Bible says, from then onwards, an angel descended from heaven and slaughtered the Assyrian armies. When the, when the Israelites woke up in the morning, 185,000 Assyrian soldiers were dead. Senukerub ran away and went home. When he got home, the politics of his losses came back to haunt him. See, the Assyrians kill for pleasure. Having failed and cost them the life of 185,000 people, his two sons murdered him for his failure. Okay? Now it's shocking to you sons killing a father. In the context of Assyria, it's normal. These are people who kill for pleasure. Okay? And maybe that should be a warning to you as well. Try not to associate with Assyrians. Um, and you know what I mean. Some of you like hanging around people who don't fear God. People who don't fear sin. People who don't fear immorality and unethicality. And you hang around them and you even use them as your connections. You even take pride in knowing them. Be careful. A day is coming when they will slaughter you. And they will have no mercy because they know you know how they work. So they don't expect you to plead ignorance. So all these people you use for your connections to get tenders, to do this, to do that. For now they are useful because they are opening doors for you. A time will come. If you watch South African politics, for me I believe South African politics is like ordained from heaven. It has all the lessons that the Bible has been saying. 
See, South African politics has something fascinating about it. People always work as a group, but somehow the media always catches one. I don't know how. There are people this country has been trying to prosecute for years. They are not prosecutable. Yes. Others are, have been prosecuted, sentenced, and they are now even about to get parole. The one who started the issue is still in charge. Do not walk with Assyrians. The they know how to survive murder. You don't. <laughs> when the time comes for Assyrians to make sacrifices, they will sacrifice you. Because you see, you are half holy, half rotten. They know at least you go to church, you have a conscience. So when the hawks come, they will push all the receipts your way. Yeah. <laughs> Avoid Assyrians. Avoid Assyrians. Try not to have a, a, a relationship with a married man or woman thinking they will marry you. Yeah. If they could not fear desolating the first marriage, where will they get the holiness to honor this one? <laughs> Don't walk around with Assyrians. They'll murder you. You, 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 will you will love a guy and plead with him to leave his wife for you. He will leave. But then his Assyrian tendencies will rise again. Now you will be the sacrificial lamb. And then you will come and ask people to pray for you. The other lady also prayed. Her church also fasted. But you were a powerful demon. Now someone has become a powerful demon to you. Don't associate with Assyrians. Walk away. A married man comes to you and tries to say things. Tell him, get thee behind me. Get thee behind me. You say something again, I'll find your wife on Facebook. I'll tell her exactly what you said. <laughs> you guys like it. Oh, no, you know. It's going to work out. He likes me. He loves me. He's having marital problems. All of us have marital problems. Let me tell you, we have invested all our lives in those marriages. We are not going to leave. Amen. It's a lie. Amen. It's a lie. I have sons in that marriage who need me. I have built assets in that marriage that I will lose if I leave my wife. Over and above loving my wife, it makes common sense to stay. Never be a fool and think he will leave his wife for you. He is not. He has built a life there. But he will gladly take your few nights of forgetting his troubles. So avoid Assyrians. Uh, avoid, avoid Assyrians. Avoid Assyrians. They'll get you killed, brother. And so, why are we coming to this story today? Because what I want to share with you today is that while we are looking forward to the second coming of Jesus, I want you to know that he is not just coming then. I want you to know that today he still comes when you lay your letters at the altar. Amen. See, so many Christians are in pain waiting for Jesus to relieve them when he comes again. But I've come to tell you that you don't need to wait for them. Today, every day, he comes. Looking for those who have taken troublesome letters in their lives and have laid them at the altar. Amen. See, God will not watch us suffer, consoling himself with the fact that when he comes again, he will fix things. Yes, he will fix things when he comes again. But I have good news for you. He doesn't want to delay relieving your pain. Here and now, you don't need to wait for the second coming for you to lay in front of him those bills you cannot pay. To go to the altar and show them the letters that say you've been blacklisted. See, you don't need to wait for the second coming for Jesus to sort that out. He still comes every day to read the bills of those who've been blacklisted. See, today, you don't need to wait for the second coming. Here today, you can lay before him the letter 
and the note that your doctor has written for you that says you have cancer, you have diabetes, you have HIV, you have this, you have that. You don't need to live with that letter only to present it to him when he comes again. That is a letter he is willing to read today. There are things he will sort then, but there are things he wants to sort today. And you need not... See, there are some Christians who think by suffering inside, they prove their righteousness. No, you prove your stupidity. There are things God is willing to deal with today. He doesn't need you to prove your faith by sitting in the fire today. He can quench the fire today and still meet you at the second coming. So many of us have converted poverty into righteousness. We think the poorer you are, the more holy you look before God. There is no righteousness in poverty. Poverty is a curse of a sinful world. So in your poverty, you think you will make it to heaven. No, God could have made you rich here and still took you to heaven. There is nothing about being rich that takes away your right to go to heaven. Do not hold on to poverty trying to prove righteousness. Because you will get to heaven and be told, actually, we didn't need you to be poor to save you. You just found it useful. We did not. Today, today, you can take your unemployment status and lay it at the altar. You don't need Jesus to come back for that to be sorted. He comes for that today. Come on. Today. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Right now. Today, he still comes for the lonely. For the suicidal. For those who are struggling with drugs. For those who are caught in prostitution. These are things he does not want to delay. It pains him to see his children suffer. Yes, sir. He has no interest in you waiting for the second coming to be solved from these issues. Yes, Today, the altar is open. Amen. You can still come to him. Open your books. Lay them before him. Oh, yes. And say, Jesus, I know you are coming one day, but that day is not today. Today I am unemployed. Perhaps tomorrow you are coming, but today I am starving. Tomorrow you are coming, coming. Today I am sick. Tomorrow you are coming. Today my marriage is falling apart. Tomorrow you are coming. Today I'm struggling with drugs. Please come today. Yes. I tell you the truth. For your sake, he lives tomorrow to come to today, to solve today, and go back to tomorrow to prepare for it. You don't need to delay. Sometimes when we preach about the second coming of Jesus, people think we are saying that they should no longer try and live a good life. That's not what the gospel is about. See, that was the mistake that we made in 1844. To think that the second coming is the illogical cessation of life. The second coming of Jesus is not a call to irrationality. It is a call to holy living, not to irrational non-living. Is he coming? Yes, he is. He is, and we are sure of it. Yes, sir. However, there are things he wants to do for you today. Amen. And so today, I do not want to tell you about what tomorrow will look like. Today, I have been asked by God to tell you what today is going to look like. <laughs> and this message is for all of you who are holding on to a painful situation, who have given up, who perhaps believe that it will never go right, who have resigned themselves to pain, to those of you who have said, I've stopped fighting, I am losing this one. It is okay to stop fighting, but it is not okay to believe he's not coming for you today. Today. 
Someone is sitting here and their finances are in trouble. Things are not going well. Every month end is a war zone. In your life, in your pocket, and in your mind. I've come to tell you, he can do something about it today. Even if you used to be horrible in the way you handled finances, even if you've never returned a tithe, he's not coming because you have a good background. He's coming because you need him. He can come for you today. Today I'm here to tell somebody who's sitting in this audience who is sick. Whether it's a chronic illness or a short-term illness, I've come to tell you that I know a guy who is coming soon, but he's also here today for your sickness. See, that's why he said, by my stripes, you are healed. He didn't say, by my stripes, you will be healed when I come. He spoke it in the present tense. By my stripes, you are healed. And he's come to ask me to tell you today, today, if you put your doctor's prescription on the altar and we pray for it in faith, he can do something Amen. about your situation. Amen. Today, seated here right now, married or not married, there are some of us who are in relationships that are breaking our hearts daily. We sleep in tears. We just don't know where this thing is going. I've come to tell you that the great, greatest lover of them all has come for you. He doesn't want you to live in miserable relationships hoping to be rescued when he comes. Today, he can teach you what true love really means and rescue you today. There are some of you who are lonely. You are married, you are not married, you have friends, you have relatives, and yet in the midst of all of that, you've got Facebook, you've got a car, you've got... Still, you are empty. Surrounded by many voices, surrounded by friends, surrounded by relatives, yet you feel like you are alone. You sit in a dinner table with friends and relatives and feel like they are talking to a shell and you are not there. I've come to tell you, there is a man who is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. And he does not want you to be lonely until that day when he comes. Today. He would like you to place that letter on the altar. And he does something about it. If that is your prayer, if you've got a matter that you have thought needs the second coming, but now you want it sorted now. This is your opportunity to stand and pray with me. For those of us who are comfortable with those things,